and then put in the, uh, the earthquakes as they've occurred. Although there isn't a fault that's directly aligned with the uh, earthquake sequence, there are some faults that are close by which are semi-parallel to it. A lot of short faults and a lot of intersecting faults. It's very complicated in the earthquake area. Um, maybe this had a relationship with all these foreshocks that occurred. Maybe a lot of little faults had to break to create the situation for the magnitude 5 to occur. And rather than set off even bigger quakes, larger faults nearby may have actually helped spare Reno from devastation. The, uh, the earthquake itself appears to be bounded by two of the larger faults. Um, and maybe this was important. Uh, the earthquake nucleated, it began the rupture. It ruptured a couple miles, uh, but it hit a weakness and stopped at that one. So maybe the, the fault pattern had a role in controlling the size of the earthquake and limiting it to a magnitude five. When scientists finally retrieve months of data from GPS units, they're stunned by what they discover. Reno's residents haven't felt it, but the ground beneath them continues to move. In the end, it turned out that the Earth moved post-seismically, that is after the earthquake, almost three times as much as it did during the earthquake. That means more energy has been released after the earthquake than during the earthquake. But this massive release of energy was not accompanied by any strong shaking. The post-seismic motion that happened months after the earthquake is a very slow, very small movement. Uh, this is a movement of a few centimeters over months time. So no one would feel this because it's a very slow and steady motion. This post seismic motion is actually still going on now a year later. And this is a significant new discovery that uh, we've made that was totally unknown. But each scientific discovery wrestled from the swarm produces more questions than answers. I think to this day we still wonder why. What exactly confined them to uh, four miles or shallower? Um, and what's going on <laughs> down below four miles? I don't know that we have a great answer for that even today. Ultimately, an earthquake is a, a release of energy. So the question becomes, how does it get stored in that shallowest few kilometers? Despite the uncertainty, what is indisputable is that all residents of Nevada must remain vigilant. We could say the swarm is over, but that does not relieve us of the responsibility to prepare for large earthquakes in this area. We could have another magnitude six earthquake in, at any time. The next large event in this area could come with no warning. I mean, there could be no foreshocks, no ramp up. Um, it could be instantaneous. Unfortunately, as the swarm tapers off, you know, apathy creeps back in. And in some case, you know, the preparedness levels have tapered off. We don't want people to be in a constant state of paranoia, but, but we do want people to be in a constant state of readiness. Even, even to this very day, we receive earthquake alerts several a week, sometimes a couple a day. Scientists in Reno may never fully understand what happened beneath them in 2008. It's remarkable, and maybe it's a testimony to how powerful and how much energy there is stored in the Earth. It exposes our vulnerability, I think, because we, as humans, think, oh, this is solid rock and so on, and, and the Earth moves just a few centimeters, and we're terrified. But while investigations continue, the focus remains on getting Reno ready for the next time the Earth decides to attack. The message that, that we hope comes out of the earthquake swarm is that Nevada is, remains, earthquake country. As our population expands, um, you know, it, it is not a question of if we'll experience an earthquake, it's when and to what magnitude.